You know, I'm trying to get out of the, you know, the everyday sort of world, I guess, the bland world. This is like cat. Germany for the last six years and has just come back in the last two months. He sold a ton of work in Germany. Is he moving back here? Yeah, time? yeah. I don't remember. Because oh, I wasn't there for long, I was only here for a couple of months. Oh, right. I don't yeah. happen. I moved to Sydney, that's right. Yeah, because John was there the whole time. Yeah. He, he was the. Um, no, it'd be hard to describe him. I just can't remember. I remember yeah. what you were painting, yeah. but I can't remember anyone else there. Yeah, he shows at Australian galleries. He's shown at Australian galleries for years. Okay. I'm not ringing the bells. Uh, well, I thought that you and John used to have a yak and share cigarettes. I don't, I've never smoked. Oh, well, there sure you go. Wrong. I've got that wrong. Never smoked. Never mind, Marty. I'm a curator. Hi. Hi. Come and come in here. Cheerio. Now, you want a carousel or something, please? Oh, you bring you one. Oh, oh, wait a minute, you want to eat, find it easier to do it on the light table? Oh, no, it's good. I'm, I'm, okay, I'm I'll, I'll bring you one, yep. Yeah. Freaky. Yeah, it's completely, it's, they're in a tin shed. They used to be in a beautiful building. It's going down. You haven't, you haven't changed in 18 years? <laughs> no, 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 I, I don't change at all. <laughs> okay, look, can I just leave you for yes. a few minutes? Yes. What I want to do is uh, run off and see that the room is okay. Yeah. 84, came back and <coughs> did a postgrad. Uh, I was going through that year with John Campbell and uh, Victor Meertens and uh, Elizabeth Newman and uh, Lynn Boyd, Tim Jones, Bernard Sachs. That was a 
the big year. Vic Mavridis was. Uh, It was actually a two-year course, I just did one year of the two years. They said I was too good, and they just said, oh, you don't need to do the second year. Oh, I left early. I just couldn't overpack this time. I thought it would be over in ten minutes. Probably good to be there. And what can you prepare? I've been to a couple of talks where people read off pages, you know, they typed it all out, it's just completely wooden. If you can't talk about your own work, you might as well give up. I'll show you. This is the painting that got the forklift through it. What a tragedy. He called me two hours before my opening yesterday, and he said, Stuart, I've got some terrible news. <laughs> Your paintings are right, but it's got two big forklift holes at the bottom of the painting. And I don't know what to do. You know, this is like I meant to go to an opening and uh, that's why I was a little bit sort of, uh, had an underlying sort of uh, nervousness. You know, I was kind of freaked out. But I was, you just let it go. I mean, it's their responsibility. They're going to fix it up. These things happen. Look what happened to uh, Dobell's um, Dobell's painting. So if it got burnt, they had to completely remake it. Did it go fall into nothing? Yes. With his nose in longer any good or bad or no judgment. Uh, just uh, yeah, judgment. Simply was the modern life is one that is about uh, a sort of horror vacui. And what you then get in terms of falling figures is something entirely new. Because in Goy often he leaves large parts of, uh, not so much the paintings, but more the prints, if you think of the disaster of war prints. He leaves large parts of the print blank, or the space is not defined in any meaningful way, in a perspectival kind of uh, sort of way. And so what you have is figures just falling into nothingness. Right. And that becomes a scene then, in later 19th and 20th century art, but you know, you know, it's just sort of the sense of in, undifferent indifference, sense of meaninglessness, absurdity, horror vacui, and of course, you know, the great example is sort of Hitchcock's with uh, you know Vertigo and, and things like that. You know, the scene of the detective, the searcher, who you know, and in a sense, a scene of the modern contemporary human being. interesting Hitchcock made that in the 1950s and in a sense you know some of your imagery your mind's one of some uh, you know in a, in a sort of more colorful way obviously um, but quite, quite of, uh, you know, stuff, Hitchcock yeah. you know and the sort of every man character like a Jimmy Stewart yeah. you know who plunges and doesn't know where he's plunging <laughs> There's no up or down, there's no foreground, background, there's no meaningful space any longer, which is sort of a metaphysical sort of notion that has been realised. Uh, she or he is coming on Friday to do a talk. Yeah. Volcano. Better make for McFarlane. Or Leffler for that matter. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go around. 30 students. Well, 10 to 30. I can't promise you any more than that. I can't talk to 10 students. I'm out of here if there's 10. Supposed to introduce you all. You, you don't mind a sort of informal introduction, do you? No, no. Oh, good. That's good. I actually had one arranged for you in July, and I had to cancel it because I could have been about four or five people to go. Wow. Put a 
put on there, just to see how big you want it. <laughs> uh, Stuart is a very interesting painter. Uh, if you have a look at his book, which is in the library, you can see more on uh, his past work. Uh, Stuart was a student here in the mid 80s uh, in the house of long days of postgraduate art education here. Uh, and Stuart has had many exhibitions uh, around Australia. He's ex exhibited overseas in New York, but he had a, a period in New York and in other places. <laughs> Liebe Freunde der Galerie, ich möchte Sie herzlich willkommen heißen und mich zuerst bei Ihnen bedanken, dass Sie heute der Einladung gefolgt sind. Stuart McFarlane aus Australien. Good to see you all here tonight and a great honor to be able to celebrate the works of the Australian artist Stuart McFarlane here in Berlin. But he's been a commendable painter for a decade and a half or more, 20 years, sort of here in Australia. But he'll explain that uh, himself to himself. And can you please turn out the light in the in the corner? I was born in Adelaide, in 1953, and went to art school when I was 16. Um, David Dowitz was my main uh, teacher at art school, and David Dryden taught me in high school. He was very important. There weren't many galleries when I was uh, um, a student. The main gallery was the Benithan Gallery, and I used to go there and see the Blackmans and the, the Nolan exhibitions and uh, Dickerson's, and I used to go to the South Australian Art Gallery quite a bit. And uh, the, these paintings really um, gave me a lot of inspiration, really fed me. It's actually uh, it's the late 60s, early 70s, and. Uh, Quite a strong time for those Australian figurative paintings. This is my, my father, and his name's Reginald John McFarlane. Reg has got a particular favourite painting. This was called August Night in Hoddle Bridge. Uh, Reg, what do you like? Why do you like this painting so much? Well, that's uh, the way the uh, plants have been brought out. And the way the wind just started to lift it. And, and uh, also, like the details are fantastic. Really. The way the wind has blown the hair up, and, they, um, and then the question is asked is she trying to save the girl, or is she one, the one that pushes her in? Dad, you've always liked to collect these strange uh, postcards and bits and pieces. Why is that? Why are you fascinated with these things for? Well, probably because you got nothing on. So you got nothing on. Yeah. Do you think that might have uh, had some? Influence? Oh, unless you got something on. It, like, it all depends. Has that influenced uh, you, you know, me? Do you reckon? With my painting? Oh, I think yes. Probably. Well, do you think you're responsible for, for the way I paint sometimes, or? Oh, yes, but um, I think you've gone off a bit now, haven't you? Gone off a bit? Yeah, off the new stuff. Well, hopefully. I hope, I hope I've grown out of it. Yeah. Oh, good. I'm painting some sensible stuff. Yeah. Now, this painting here, I painted uh, when you came to visit me in Gippsland. This is called Heart of the Valley, and that's you sitting on the bed there. Uh, that was done in 1985. What do you remember about that painting? Uh, who, is you who are you talking about? Is it about the, the, the girl? Uh, you're posing with this naked woman. But I uh, didn't know that at the time. You, what, you posed separately? Yes. Um, you sat on the uh, table at first and uh, we had a, a trial. Whether I could hold the bottle upside down or that. And in desperation, because I was coming back to Adelaide that day, and in desperation, he said, I would hold, 
And that's all I did. You have to hold your hand out. Yeah. So you used to paint on beer glasses, didn't you? You used to draw with a... That's right, yeah. Yeah, nudes. You used to draw nudes with a dental drill, didn't you? On a glass. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, very good, they were. Yeah, what happened to it? Uh, I've still got one. You used to uh, do a lot of them. I think I might, I've got my talent from this man. Yeah. Talent from you? What's that? Talent from you. <laughs> Let me tell it from you. Oh. Yeah. When, when I started, there was 80 bookmakers on the, 80 bookmakers on the flat. Yeah. And now, 80 in the flat, uh, 50 in the knee, and 45 in the ground stop. That's just 180. That's just the middle front of the forest. And today, the flat shut. The derby shut, and, do it on the, floor, and the, the, the only bookmakers left are in the grand stand, and there's 12. 12 bookmakers left? Eight? Only 12 left? Only 12 left. Wow. Uh, out of, it used to be 180. But, um, oh, I suppose it's, um, uh, Peter have lost interest in yeah, racing. How old are you now, Dad? Next uh, Sunday. Uh, I'll be nice next Sunday. Wow. If I did that, <laughs> But, uh, oh, uh, how old are you? I'll be 50 next Sunday. No, no, it's not yes. say. On the 23rd of November. 24th. 24th of November. All right, thank you very much. How about that? That was very good. The goal of any artist is just to work completely undistracted, uh, not worrying about any sort of... Uh, Problems with raising money, rent, materials, and the constant sort of uh, mm -hmm. daily hassles. Essentially, put a, a person in a painting, for me, it's just everything changes. People can relate to the mood, the way they look, the way they dress. Mm -hmm. uh, so the people sort of like act out uh, my emotions, my feelings. I think they are very much real women, and they are real women facing the problems uh, that confront women in this society and problems of relationships, problems of, of asserting themselves, problems of being done in sometimes. In a clear day, you're in the room with a woman. She looks at you. The man on the balcony looks back at you and or her. It's not simply because the eyes are directed at the painter, other characters, or you as the viewer, but because the narrative of the events in the picture suggests possible scenarios that have taken place or are about to and these eye contexts serve only to expand the number of narrative possibilities. The look varies in each painting, but inevitably it is there. Yes, they're, they're film noir stories in, in film noir settings, but often in broad daylight. There are servos and there are phone boxes that maybe don't work. There are petrol pumps, roads, people by dark or bright motor cars that are probably on the way to or from some crime, cars that have just been knocked off. The stories hint at people who are out of control, men who are on the edge, women who are vulnerable or young or maybe they're prematurely toughened up like carny girls who've kind of dropped out of the circus and are trying to make their way uh, more dodgily in the world. They're women on the edge of panic and terror quite often and it seems irrelevant to really ask, you know, is this postmodernism, is it an uh, ironic vision of the contemporary world with a different take? Because questions and definitions like that seem silly when you've got multiple stories and multiple layers happening. And one thing's certain, these aren't paintings you'd never get bored with, because the take on realism and naturalist technique open doors on endless imaginary journeys. Is a car going to go left, go right? Who is this guy? Is he going to get in the car? It's like the beginning of a machine that creates a motion picture film. And in another way, two of these paintings are interactive stories in the watcher's mind, but edgy, very sexy ones. And as a result, Stuart's work is always been relentlessly analysed and deciphered in books, essays and symposia everywhere. You can have a look at Veronique Helmich Marsilian's uh, book, Stuart McFarlane, or the other interpreters like Vincent Katz in the Compulsion Catalogue from Brisbane in 2001, but you read too much and you end up maybe more bewildered uh, than ever before, perhaps like one of the women or men in some of his paintings who are on the edge of cracking up, because Stuart creates these engines for generating endless meanings and none of them are fixed, they're all fluid, they're always moving away from you. And from Berlin to New York to Noosa, everyone's got a different idea of what his work means. So the new edgy urban mythologies, I think, 
And I also think perhaps they're a little bit derived from John Brack's creatures of Collin Street, with the white faces and the neat suits, who look somehow as if they're about to go out of control. They don't like the city, they don't like what they've become maybe, and everything is cold. And I sometimes think that Stuart's characters, because they are characters in stories of a sort, um, are almost like descendants of Brack's uh, earlier, bleaker city visions of Melbourne. But they're people who become land developers, skimmers, casino dudes, carny girls. They're the rougher, newer, the daughter and the son you're ashamed to admit and you'll never become a lawyer like you. And so it's in some other Australia that you find the outback mythologies of Sidney Knoll and Arthur Boyd, uh, John Olson or Johnny Percival. And the interesting question I guess is now, Stuart's working in this cool Tasmanian light, are the works going to get cooler? I don't think they, they will. They always have these hot waves coming off them of danger, of sex. Uh, up there in those glassy buildings on the edge of the, the new resort, with the heats rising, and there's always a gun concealed in the desk drawer. John Brack is one of my favourite artists, and uh, he's got a fantastic vision. You know, like uh, he's got that sort of weird, sort of apart sort of vision of suburbia and contemporary culture of his society. But he's not really part of it. You know, he's just looking at it, and you know, I think these people are the, the children of that. I reckon all of uh, his paintings are not just stories, but they're actually generic stories that do look like film art. There's a dangerous woman. There's a man who's not quite up to it, but thinks he's in charge of events. Could he be a private eye? Could he be a land developer? You don't know. But the women are always on top somehow. They're sexy, they look at you out of the pictures. Sometimes they're dressed, sometimes not. And there are always complex landscapes and things going on behind them. I just enjoy creating short stories. I mean, I enjoy uh, uh, mysteries and movies and Hitchcock. I love all that. But I'm not consciously trying to copy that um, style. I'll probably cover five or so fields fairly regularly in you know, night paintings, uh, buildings, nudes, um, you know, sort of feral guys. Everyone has a range inside them. They have like you know, a field of vision which they follow through their life. To see this wonderful abstraction and then actually just tweak it a little more and it becomes, uh, it, it comes into um, focus as, as, a, as realism. This painting project has developed further in an attempt at a self-portrait in town. Painter reflection of this nature is complex both for the painter and the viewer. And the father is able to produce both an abstract and figurative painting. The orange strip on the left hand side of the painting not only anchors and defines the reflection but is also a kind of post Barnett human definition of space in the picture plane. Things basically I, I noticed in Hobart are blue and orange. There's big orange boats, orange buildings, blue skies, blue this. So it just came out immediately.
you can, blah, 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 blah. Okay. <coughs> so that's, that's where we're at. I thought Graham's going to just flip. Right I thought he could have been through. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm just not through it, it's still horrible, but you know, we've got very, very good stories today. And uh, they are really sorry the canvas and do it, you know, completely should, 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 should be. I mean, this sort of stuff can be fixed. It's just that a lot of people loathe the very thought of a restored painting. Yeah. That's the thing I was dealing with the other day. Um, he was pissed off from the fact that he had a restored painting. You looked at it really carefully, you couldn't see a thing. Yes. You looked at it under UV light, and there were the two of the tiniest little bits of retouching I've ever seen in my life. They were, you know, like uh, pinheads, practically. He was not happy. He was not happy. And people get like that. I can understand Some what? Some people just won't accept a restored painting bad at all. I can understand that. I mean, I think it's excessive, but... And this is fortunately not in a vital part, is it? It's no, it's right down the bottom corner, so... Anyways. They can fix the stretcher. Well, that's good. They can stretcher or something. Re re -sew them. That's well, they'll, they'll patch the back carefully. They're going to re-sew it. re -sew. And they can... Um, I think it's very important politically that they ask you to have a look at it before they send it off. Yeah. I think you should ask, could you please inspect the work before it goes on? Then you can ring Brad and say, look Brad, I have looked at this personally, I've been up there and I've looked at it, and as far as I'm concerned, I'm very happy with it, yeah. so it's got my okay. You write him a letter to that effect, and if and when he wants to sell it, he can sell it with that letter, because the restoration will show you put it on the line. But if you've got a letter from the artist saying, I'm completely satisfied with the quality of the restoration on this work, I think it's been done a very high stand. That will usually pacify any potential future collector. Okay. Did Di Bell send one for the um, that burnt painting? Sorry? Did Di Bell have a letter for that burnt painting? Is it? Is that um, no, um, which is why I went for sixpence. You know, that was a two million dollar picture of ever there was one, and it went for 150 or something, just as a souvenir. Yeah. And a lot of people thought it might go for 50 or 25. So I don't think it did that. Well, so. I'm feeling it was just put up for sale because everybody said, "Look, we have the first clue what this will go for." Um, you know, the New South Wales Gallery would have been through the roof for that painting. They had a really busted up to get it because it was such an important moment in the gallery's history. And there'd be a stack of private collectors who would have gone very high on it too. It was a very prestigious item to have if it had been perfect. As it was, like I say, it went for a souvenir price. Well, this is the scene of the crime, and this is where Stuart's extraordinary painting, Fuel, which may or may not be about a robbery, takes place, and uh, there's traffic everywhere. This is a real suburb, I love it. This is where real Stuart McFarlane stories take place. I think that's what I like about his paintings, that they're all set in a very definable, well, apparently definable, place, time, space, and uh, reminds me of critical paintings of the last century, like um, Popper's Nighthawks in 1942, which we find out was done straight after Pearl Harbor so as well as this narrative of people trapped in a city in a dark time there's a feeling of something is rotten outside everything's beginning to, to fall apart or even a, a picture like American Gothic Grant Wood's painting back in 1930 which looks like a, a couple just standing outside uh, sort of a gothic wooden joint uh, but it's about America it's all about America and that's what I find in Stuart's work this space time human beings cities in the edges of cities, and we're on the edge of a city most of the time in Hobart because it's one of those literal spaces and uh, you're always edging away and out of a centre. I was coming out of a op shop across the road and I was looking for records and I just it was a beautiful sunlit day and this petrol station was just lit up like this with a mountain behind it and this intense sky and uh, it just, the colour combination just blew my mind. It's basically your primary colours, your red, 
yellow blue, but it was just so startling. I mean, it, the additions to the scene, of course, of the truck, which is a busy road, and, and the people. It's, yeah, these logging trucks are, are very common, and they fascinated me from the moment I got there. That actually, don't travel up this road. I had to, I had to re, <laughs> recast this truck. They're normally travelling up Macquarie Street, which is the main street, heading out of town. And these big semis full of these massive logs, these ancient logs. And I really don't worry about the logging issue, as I'm sure they know what they're doing. But it's just a beautiful, beautiful image. I just love this man-made beast cutting these ancient logs and just you know, roaring through the sea, all this smoke pouring out. It's just fantastic. I want to do, I can see several more paintings of these big logging trucks coming up. So I hope they don't stop the logging because I need to keep painting them. Also, this, this pole here is very important to get this light pole completely in the picture. In Hobart, they've got the Tasmania Museum um, and Art Gallery. It's a combination of you know museum with artifacts and Australian art, old, colonial, modern. In this very old building, it's um, it's unlike any other art gallery in Australia. And just wandering through, you'll get a room full of fossils and skulls, and then in another room, you'll get a bunch of Australian paintings. It's quite bizarre. So, looking for inspiration, one day I just came looking at this massive, uh, tyra I think it's tyra Tyrannosaurus Rex head. But it's quite beautiful. It really, you can still feel the creature. And you can, it's just in this big glass case, and you'll get these people. I walked right behind it, and you get these people coming and looking at it. And uh, just having a normal um, member of the public looking to me wasn't enough. I had to intensify it, so I put the nude there, who seemed to be entranced by the skull. And it was also, I, I enjoy the abstract qualities. I mean, once just areas like of, of paint like this is just. It, to describe the, the, the skull in such a loose way, it's, it's, uh, it's you know, part of the thrill of the surface as well, just playing with the surface. This here is, um, is the first thing I saw when I came to Hobart, is, is this big orange boat. And I realised later on that everybody in Hobart knows this boat. It lives in Hobart six months a year, and they ignore it. It's uh, when I came, I've never seen it before. It's just it's completely outrageous. The colour it it's, um, goes to Antarctic, to the Antarctic uh, six, um, every year. And I think it's an icebreaker or something. It goes there for exploratory reasons. Um, it's called the Aurora Australis. I didn't put the name on because I didn't want to personalise the boat too much. Um, so it was there when I first got there, I just had to paint it. And I had to paint it from this position uh, just to try and get the whole feeling of the whole boat. I, it turned out to be a little bit too safe, the portrait of the boat. I just couldn't get it for ages. I had a man walking down here with a briefcase. The painting was longer. Uh, the extra length didn't help the painting at all. I had to cut it off with scissors, restretch it. I had birds all over the place. I had to get rid of those, repaint the birds about five or six times. I had trouble with his car, trouble with the sky. Um, it was a, a painting which took a very, very long time to finish. And my first study, which is um, done on the spot, had a lot of life to it, had the initial response, and then to make it a larger painting in the studio was a lot, lot, a lot harder. In Hobart, my studio's at, uh, at the top of the TNG building, at the whole fifth floor of um, the TNG building in Collins and Murray Street. And I've been there since um, September 2002. This painting is called, uh, it's called Mercury which is basically um, the name of the uh, Hobart daily newspaper. Um, that's meant to talk about the, it's, it's a reference to weather, to the heat, which you know, Hobart's not known for its heat, but this, this painting was going to a show 
uh, called heat, which was in uh, Queensland, about the weather. And uh, so I just had to try and describe the heat. Um, the scene is my studio, and uh, I rented this massive space in the, in, in, in the centre of the city, and I didn't have much idea of what to paint. And the studio was so unusual, I knew it wouldn't be there for very long. I thought I had used to a portrait of the studio, basically. It's just uh, not, it's not a space you commonly get to spend a lot of time in. This building's like 1942 building. It's um, right in the heart of the city. And it's this huge space with these big blue pillars. She had this incredibly long, dark hair, and uh, I like to paint things that um, a bit of a rarity and. Uh, the hair sort of fascinated me, and this is just worked up from the sketch I did, the large, uh, the large charcoal drawing this is worked from. I'll take a slide of the drawing and, and I'll project that onto the canvas so that I've taken care of all the problem. To finish a painting like this, I'll have the model come back about up to four or five times for about an hour or two each time. If I'm just working up ideas, I'll use the model and, and do a nude. So that's basically the structure of this painting. And to add some more story, I added the guy in the background. He's actually a painter himself. His name's Luke Wagner. He appears in the, another painting of the show called Justice. And uh, this model's name is Daniela, who I've got two models at the moment. She, and she's in several paintings. Um, not much more I can say, but it's just that it's based on such a simple idea as a portrait of the studio and, 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 a, and a painting of this model. I've always wanted to paint a Christmas tree. I mean, there's something about a Christmas tree, especially an uh, undecorated Christmas tree. Uh, so I'm just sticking there in the background. But also, that Christmas in Australia is a time of heat, high heat. So, you know, like a party's just happened or it hasn't quite been organised or something. That's my studio, that, that um, room. It's, a, it's a, the top floor of a, the TNG building in, in Hobart. It's the whole top floor, <laughs> right in the centre of town. And uh, that's one of the other fascinations about Hobart. There's a lot of empty space, office space, because they haven't quite figured out what's, you know, what's happening with the real estate there. So I'm renting this massive space of the TNG building. I couldn't quite do that in Melbourne or Sydney. And uh, that's the, so I had to paint it. I, I didn't know what to paint about, so I wanted to paint the space I was in because it was so huge and so strange. And when I was just starting off, I, um, I, will, I always work with models anyway, so I, I just thought I'd paint you know, a large noob, which is basically just kicks the eyes, ideas in and, and uh, then I move on. So The issue of logging and stuff in, in Hobart is, is, is such an important issue, and, and basically all the artists are, you know, no logging, no this, no... I, I just can't carry around these, uh, these, uh, these things weigh me down. I just, I don't want to, you know, I like to see things unimpinged by the sort of politics, basically. Uh, I don't want the whole place to be stripped bare, but I'm sure they know what they're doing. Somebody knows what they're doing, and it, that's what they're basically empowered for. Everyone's not an idiot. I don't, this is so crazy. Everyone has to, the country's not, a country's not run by complete morons, even though everyone thinks it is, and everyone's, you know, Everyone seems to know better that I run into. I mean, everyone's like a genius. They know everything about everything. But I like that's what I'm talking about by 15-year-olds. It's just like they can take care of their job, which is that's, you know, that's what they're meant to be doing. I don't want to worry about that sort of stuff. I just want to paint. It's a view um, looking out of my studio window, directly out of my window, to the opposite building across the street, which is called the Trust Bank Building, which is a ugly 70s, uh, 60s or 70s building with big orange stripes all over it and the building I'm in is a TNG building which is reflected in the window. <coughs> this, this painting here is called 7000 which is the postcode for Hobart City and this is the view outside my studio window. That's my studio window there. Um, looking straight out on a sunny day you see the TNG building which is where I paint from reflected in the next building, which is called the Trust Bank building. And then as the afternoon wears on, you start to see the people in the offices doing their work. And uh, so I had to peer out the window at these people. And, and after a while, 
they realised that I was looking at them, and it became quite uh, intimidating. So I'd be staring out the window at these office workers and a computer. Um, but that's the, that's the story with this. The, these these lights revealed themselves as the, as the day wore on.
Wishes from 